Um, let's start with time. We're great to see you all. Um, okay, it's great to be here. Um, so, love is patient. Can you give me a minute? Oh, it's going the wrong way. <laughs> yep, this word is well needed. <laughs> That's it. Reset. Thanks, Aaron. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I'm going to, like Mel, reflect a little bit on the great message last week, introducing love. It's such a big subject, so exciting. And the more I've thought about it, the more um, just actually challenging and interesting and excited I'm getting about it. And so I want to just reflect a little bit on love. I'm going to talk about patience and end with longing. Don't you long? I love that song Kate sang, you say. There's longing in that, isn't there? And uh, that's where we're going this morning, I hope. So, um, yeah, just reflecting on last week's, here's the passage from 1 Corinthians 13, particularly these verses. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. And uh, yes, last week, Aaron highlighted that the Scriptures tell us that God Himself is love, and that's a powerful thing and um, powerful thought. And uh, so it made me think, what's, what's been my experience of love? From day one, what has been my experience? I've been thinking about that and um, sort of wondering what does it tell me about my experience of God, if God is love. And and, um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience of love, Um, so be patient. It started early and it's a lot, no, yes, it did, it did. I was fortunate, I guess, um, uh, birthed into, uh, uh, as the youngest by five years to uh, lovely parents and family in a place called Huntley, and uh, yeah, I, as far as I know, uh, it was, it was, it was, I was on the cards, uh, I certainly felt wanted um, and loved, although I didn't know that's what was happening at the time, uh, and I've had a, a very fortunate experience of, from day one, knowing that uh, something good, <laughs> I guess, looking back, I can reflect on it and realize that what that did, that just sense of being wanted, being loved, being part of a family, really gave me a sense of, it's going to be okay. Whatever happens is going to be okay. And and a sense of that I'm safe. And I don't know where it came from. And I'm just thinking that is where it came from, that security and confidence that um, mom and dad gave me in a stable family, and um, they, 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 were, they were great. I don't think I got too spoiled or anything, but you can be the judge, I guess. Um, but certainly, my experience of that first love was, was really positive. Not obviously, tragically the same in, in, for, for everyone. So, so, yeah, your experience of light, love might be, well, I didn't experience love. What does that have in terms of your experience of God? So, so anyway, however much I was loved, there was more I wanted. Even I remember in primary one, I was I came home desperate. I had you know other kids. I remember coming home. I'd been off for a couple of days with a cold, you know, how it is. Um, and but I went back to school. And in the playground, we were playing a game. I was put third in command of whatever game we were playing. Michael uh, was number one. Obviously, the cool kid in the class. Oh, was it Michael, isn't it, Michael? Um, and then there was Ross, who was the funny kid in the class. And then there was me. I think I was a tall kid in the class or something. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, I went home very excited to tell my mother that I was third in, third, third. I was, yeah, I felt good about that. I needed not just my parents' love, but acceptance. I wanted to be popular. I wanted to, to be part of the, the gang, even as early as that. And believe it or not, I remember, I'm sure it was primary one, maybe in primary two, give myself some credit. Eve, I told you about her in the past. Oh my gosh. 
there was more love out there. I knew it. I knew it, even from an early age. And um, certainly, uh, a love, friendship love, and uh, acceptance, and, and romantic love, and uh, family love, and uh, is all part of it. And um, as, as I grew, and, and, and as I experienced that in different ways, those intense feelings of wanting, wanting to be uh, accepted, wanting to be chosen, wanting to be preferred, wanting to be um, loved, I suppose, grew, particularly when I was a teenager, uh, and particularly the romantic love grew as a, a priority, and um, yeah, and uh, I, I won't go into that, I've told you in the past, but my wife is now sitting here, and um, Sally, bless her heart, yeah. I had a, yeah, um, so interestingly, before we got married, and before we even met, before we went out, I remember having a very, I'd become a Christian when I was 20, I've shared in the past, and um, the, the romantic side of things changed, and uh, God started working in my heart, and um, for ever, I didn't have a girlfriend. I mean, it was forever. It was like four years at least, five years. When you're in your 20s, it's like, that's for it. It's never going to happen. That's it. I'm on the shelf. It's done. And uh, God, ask me. I remember, I mean, talk about longing. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to say God sat me down one night, but it felt a bit like that. And um, this question dropped in my head. What is it you really want about marriage and a partner? And I was like, well, okay. Um, why do you want it so much? And I, I remember by that stage, I'd identified that there were two people in my life that I felt I had loved and loved me, a, a, a good friend and, and, and um, a girlfriend. I thought, and I knew then that, that I would never have that period in my life when I was so close. We just spent time with each other. That with your teenage years, you're just no responsibilities and having fun all the time. It's brilliant. And I thought, I'm never going to have that again until I get married. I need that intimacy, love, and acceptance. The only way I'm going to find it is through finding a marriage partner. I'm going to, the only way that somebody will really know me, somebody will really choose me, somebody will really accept me, somebody who really knows what I'm about, and those things that we shared that made us feel loved, and just, you could laugh without knowing what you were saying because you just knew it. That was, it can only be when I'm spending time with my partner, and God said, so you want somebody who really, really knows you, who really, really loves you, who really, really wants to spend time with you, who really chooses you. And it started to dawn on me what I'd been longing for all my life. And I'd come to faith, but this was late. I was like, oh, it's you I've been wanting all this time. You know me. You chose me. <laughs> Even, you know, the, the tig, in the, in, are you getting chosen in the playground? Oh, he, and God says he chose us. He loves us. And he knows me. He knew everything. I said, I know. And I could hear him say, I know everything. I know everything about you. I have been. It's like, it's you. And then um, that was a precious moment for me. And then um, probably <laughs> prepared me a little bit and helped <laughs> uh, Sally um, not have too much pressure. Um, when, I, when we came along, we got together. And that's been beautiful. And um, that intimacy, that need for intimacy is huge. So, so, yeah, that's a little bit of my experience of love, and, uh, and it, it led me to God. It led me to God, and um, that, that, that's where I think it's so important to talk about love, because we use love, and we want to understand what the nature of God's love really is, and we want to be able to understand it in the cultural context, and we use the word love in lots of different ways. I love to go out with my Son-in-law is for a curry last night, and I love my wife. And I wrote um, thanks to my boss in a text, love you, have a good weekend, by mistake. And it, he, he didn't notice. It was like, it's, it's just, you know, oops. And um, yeah, it happens. But love is everywhere, isn't it? You just, you know, it's just, you just throw it. It's a throwaway thing. So when God loves you, it's like, well, what's going on? Next slide would probably help us here, um, uh, Clara. And um, C.S. Lewis, um, um, famous author, of course, 
a Christian writer, writer and theologian, uh, wrote a book called The Four Loves. And uh, when we're talking about love, it's really helpful to know and think about it. The Greeks had four words for love. And I um, won't spend, hopefully, too much time on this. Just, just uh, put it in there and look at it. We'll, there'll, there'll be resources available. We'll, I'm sure it'll sort of come up again in the, in the series. But there's basically, the Greeks had four words. Uh, uh, storge, which is talking about family love, as, we, as we've shared. Um, uh, eros, uh, passionate love and erotic love. Uh, obviously, the word comes from the same root. And uh, so love between... Um, uh, partners and things like that. Uh, philia, which is a friendship love, the love of a friend, a loyal friend. David and Jonathan famously were, uh, he, they, David loved Jonathan. It's this friendship love that's so uh, important. And uh, then there's, a, but there's one more, agape love, which is a self-sacrificial, unconditional love. And uh, the agape love that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13 is that word. It's it's laying down your life for your friends. And we see there's lots of um, times in the Bible when love is used. And um, these Greek words, the New Testament was written in Greek, um, and these words are used. But when we talk about uh, love is patient, it's, it's the agape, I believe, that's what's talking about. Love, laying down your life, sacrificial love. And we see the other terms. Jesus talked about loving the disciples. Uh, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, to lay down your life for another. That's agape, I'm sure. That you're my friends. That's, that's the, the filial love. And he talks about the love of the Father, love of the Son, and um, we're children of God. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love, Paul writes, and long for my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this. So love is manifest them. I bet the context helps us. Don't need to worry too much about that, but it's just helpful to think about when we try and understand what is the nature of God's love for you and I. Just good to know. Just think about that. And I think um, moving, you know, we're thinking about patience particularly, and it's the first quality of love that's mentioned. I don't know if that's significant. It might be. I've certainly recognize and as looking into this quality of love that is patience, what it's talking about. It's a powerful expression. I think it's about waiting. And it's not just about putting up and shutting up. It's not just about intolerance. I want to know what godly patience is about at its heart and patience to learn to wait on God. When um, Sally and I were not dating, but had, I'd asked her out. She said, um, well, she didn't, yeah, she wasn't non-committal. She was, she was warm, <laughs> but not yet. I had to wait for six months. She didn't say, you have to wait for six months. She, that just happened. There were circumstances and other things. And, um, but we wrote to each other, and I started phoning her. And I started on a Saturday morning, lying in bed waiting. The one thing I wanted to hear, remember letters going through the letterbox, dropping on the floor? I could hear it. I was like, oh, this longing. I started to long for Sally, even, even more. I started to want that time we would be together. But it became a beautiful season, not a difficult season. It was a time for growing and for um, experiencing and, and, and the waiting. And in that waiting period, the, we, we did get to know each other. I, I, by letter, we understood that Sally was vegetarian. In the return letter, she confirmed that uh, if I was able to make mints, that would be a benefit to the, to the family. So that was okay. I was not having to commit to too much in my marriage. <laughs> um, anyway, the waiting is a beautiful period. And um, just looking, so what can patience do? Let's, uh, just, uh, sorry, loads of scriptures here. That, that if you look and do a Bible study on patience and patient 
um, that there's just so much going on. So there's just a sample and some of the things, and you know, we can learn from the wisdom of Proverbs that patience is powerful to, you know, to even influence leaders. Patience is powerful to quell the disputes. Patience is powerful um, to, to calm anger. To overcome intolerance, to bring peace. Patience achieves things. Patience is not passive. And I, got, I did my best to get to know Sally in that six month period. I took advice from Jimmy and Elma. What should I do? And he said, Start doing your dishes. Start doing your dishes because when you get married, you're going to need to do the dishes and get ready and get tidy. Don't, don't leave a mess. So I did. I started practicing, I started having a tidy home. And I, I, I asked about, oh, what should I say in my letters? Ask about the kids. Okay, what's, tell me about your children. Yeah, I did that. And I was, All right, okay. Patience is not passive. It's powerful. But it's also forward-looking. Um, uh, uh, the Psalms, David, oh my gosh, David. The longing that he expresses, Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up out of the slimy pit. And throughout the, the Psalms we hear people crying out for God, desperate for God, needing God. Oh, the, the desire is phenomenal. And Nehemiah is a summary of, this, of the whole Old Testament and the relationship of Israel with God and their failure to follow God. And be, how God had to be so patient. It says God is, was patient with them continually, but until in the end, he just, well, he just had to let them go and say, okay, go your way. And the enemies came in, and they were ransacked, and they faced disaster. But never without abandoning them, he says, for God is a gracious and merciful God. God is patient. Then we, the teachings of Jesus, which I've even captured here, the, the, the teaching of Jesus, the parable of the, the, um, prodigal son, the dad, waiting in Luke 15, waiting and looking and seeking, desiring the son to come home. And then he did. The teachings of the disciples who'd been with Jesus, learning and seeing, oh, I get this. We do not become lazy, but we imitate those who through faith and patience, inheritance, inherit what has been promised. They understand in all the difficulties and trials that they were suddenly facing that it was, it was the, 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 where was God was a, must have been an easy answer. What was happening? I thought this was it. I thought Jesus' resurrection, that was it. But Paul particularly, that last, what they suffered, oh my gosh, Paul more than others, rather as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. It does sound like sort of parenting, doesn't it? Gosh, hard going. Anyway, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. The early disciples suffered hugely, and yet had hope and patience and perseverance because they had hope. They had an assurance and hope. And their patience got them through and helped them through. But their forward vision, patience looks forward and takes you through and drags you through because you're really looking and longing for something that is going to happen and you're sure about it and it's coming and it's worth waiting for. And because of that, I'm going to suffer all things, Paul says. Nothing will be too great to Make sure this, I hold on to this. So patience is powerful. Patience is forward looking. Just moving on. Clara, thanks. How can we grow then in patience? How can we grow in patience? How can we grow? We need to catch a vision of our future hope and understand that is so good. So we understand God created the world, that Jesus came and intervened, but is returning. And we hope for that day. 
that's when everything is fulfilled. That's when I finally meet Jesus, the one that I really love, the one that I really need. We need to have a revelation of Jesus. And my old friend Simeon that I've talked about a couple of times must have caught this vision. Simeon, as if you remember, was the one waiting in the temple who'd been moved by the Holy Spirit, who wanted nothing more than to see the salvation of Israel, to find the Messiah. And he saw the infant Jesus and held him in his hands and declares, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now desist, dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. He saw it and he wanted it and there was nothing else in Simeon's world that he wanted more than to see the salvation. He longed for it. He would He said, yeah, I can die now. I can die happy. That's it. I've seen it. I've got it. I've received it. The promise has come, and I know it's coming. It's just an infant, but it's coming, and he's coming again, that longing, that vision, and if we can grow our understanding and vision of this is what God is like, this is what he's going to do, this hope, this love that he's coming to bring when he returns the the salvation of all creation, of of, God. Bringing in heaven and earth together is worth the wait. Martin Luther King famously, powerfully, his last sermon, 3rd of April, 1968, must have had a similar vision. Even though he wanted the world to change, he was fighting. His patience was active, powerful, moving. And he, but he, he knew there was trouble on the way, of course. There was trouble all the time in the civil rights movement. Opposition, persecution, that's what they're fighting for. But he had a hope, he had a vision, and he saw, I think, something more than just heaven on earth. But it, I'm not sure, but here's his words. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. This is the hope that God wants to deposit right now, right here in our hearts, in your hearts. That this hope, this land, His purposes, His kingdom coming is everything that we could ever want and ever need. And everything the world will ever want and everything creation needs. Because He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He goes on to say, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. Life meant nothing to Him. I just want to do God's will. Oh, if we could be like that. Simeon shows us the way. The Holy Spirit moved him, gave him the desire, gave him the revelation. The Holy Spirit, this only comes from the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Where else can it come from? It can only come like anybody. I want just to do God's will. And so I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing. Perfect love casts out fear. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That's our hope. That's where the greatest of patience can come from. It's beautiful. So what do we need to do? Finally, the last slide. What do we need to do? We need to see Jesus. Hebrews puts it perfectly. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out, marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary 
and lose heart. Don't grow weary. Don't lose heart. It's worth waiting for. It's coming. It will come. It's sure. And if we, what we focus on will grow, we need to grow our understanding of God's love for us, of God's love for the world. We need to grow our understanding of what Jesus has done and what he's going to do. We need to fix our eyes on him, and it will start to grow in us to become more than everything else, and everything else will pale into significance. We'll understand that the world does not do it. When Sally finally walked down the aisle with me, we stood hand in hand, and her father, Scott Hutchison, who we've shared about, a minister in the Church of Scotland, legendary in many circles, literally, as a Christian minister, was saying the uh, blessing, and, and uh, he, I, I'd forgotten, I remembered it this week, he used this passage, which is often used, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, does not dishonor others. And then he changed it. And he started putting our names in. And he said, Alan is patient. <laughs> Just about, if I was on a seat, I would have fallen off. I was going, what did you say? You have no idea how much I wanted this guy's affirmation, by the way. <laughs> I'm just marrying his daughter. And he's saying, I'm patient. Do you know? What do you know that I don't know? I was like, what? And then he said, Sally is kind. I go, well, yeah, that's obvious. Everybody knows that. Patient? Are you sure? And then 10 years later, 15 years Ali, I think he was more saying, Alan, you need to become patient. <laughs> Maybe knew a little bit of what was going on before. Bless his heart. Thank you, Scott Hutchison. I want to become more patient. To this day, I need to become more patient. We, we all need these qualities in increasing measures, for sure, wherever we're at. But it's great to think, can I plug in any of our names into this? I'll let you do that for homework. <laughs> can we fit there? There's where we want to go, and I believe the power and the grace and the, the love of the Holy Spirit, the vision as it's growing. When we're getting towards the end of the series, yeah, maybe. I was like, oh, I'm, it's, it's coming <laughs> for each and every one of us. That's what we're helping each other do. We're just trying to help each other grow in this path and this passage and grow in this love, this beautiful, powerful, unique love that comes from God, that God is love, that he died for, and he showed us that Jesus, here we can say it for sure, Jesus, Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Can we um, reflect on this? Jesus does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. Jesus does not dishonor others. He is certainly not self-seeking. Thy kingdom come. Lord God, your will be done on earth as it is. And Jesus is not easily angered. He is patient with you and with me and with the whole world. He is waiting, sitting at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. How good does that begin to see and understand when this is what he's talking about? This is the real love. It's Jesus who is the real love. Jesus keeps no record of our wrongs. Oh my goodness, how amazing, how powerful, how wonderful. Jesus does not delight in evil, of course, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. And Kate, uh, Cl Clara, sorry, let's just um, ready to finish uh, now with that last video. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that it's you. That is you that is our love. That is you that is our hope. Help us see you more clearly. Help us understand what you've done for us and have that revelation of you your love for us growing every day in Jesus' name. I just need to finish with Martin Luther King. You need to hear him say it. You need to hear him say it. I hope this works. I hope this works. Here we go. Enjoy this. We've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. 
I left Atlanta this morning and then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Come on, let's stand together. Let's stand together. Just give the Lord an applause. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you, you have shown us the promised land and you've given us the way. If the band can come back up, let's finish with a song of worship and praise. Oh, Lord Jesus, let's pray together. Let's lift up our hands if you can. And Lord, we just thank you for what you've done on the cross, that you have brought us hope, you have brought us love, and your love is death-defying. Thank you, Jesus, for your incredible love, for the incredible power of your love, for the hope that you've given the world, that your love is everything, everything we're seeking, everything we're wanting, everything we're hoping for. The world tries to give us something of it, but it just falls short. Your love is the real deal. Your love is the real thing. Lord Jesus, fill us with your love like right now holy spirit uh, 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 we open our hearts to say come help me see help me see the promised land help me understand what you've done on the cross your resurrection truth and victory the hope that you're restoring all things and you will do it in jesus name fill us lord with that vision fill us with that hope fill us with your patience oh lord jesus hallelujah thank you lord thank you lord that you're coming you're coming, oh God. You're coming, oh God. You're coming, oh God, to fill us again, to fill us afresh, to fill us anew, to shine your light. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that yours is the hope. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.